Welcome to this version of the Memory Team Weekly Meeting. It is November 30th. There's a bunch of non-verbalized topics on there. Although I'm gonna ask a question. Did folks on this call know that we had book clubs? I didn't. I don't know. Okay, good. No, Glad to um, we have a product book club, but I'm not sure if that's related. This is the first engineering focus book club I've seen. A lot of them have been like management related, um, but they're doing Ruby under a microscope. It started last week. So if you want to join, um, I think tomorrow's the next meeting. You wouldn't be too far behind. Um, but they've been, I've been on a couple of book clubs. They've been pretty interesting. So anyway, glad I shared. There's a bunch of other topics on there. I'll let you all catch up on. Um, so for team topics, we had some follow-up items from last week, some issues that need to be created. And uh, there was also a side conversation in memory team meeting about which epic we should create issues under. And I found a bunch that were created under the two different epics. So I think we're mostly in good shape there. There's a couple lingering, um, but I had a couple questions. So um, does do these two issues, and we got a comment on the second one, but first one, do does this one still belong in 13.7? Is it still part of our focus for the two gig footprint? Camille, you're typing. You want to just verbalize? I can type out what you're going to say. Um, I would say we should skip that one. Focus on ones that uh, provide more benefit. Uh, but revisit this one with much bigger understanding and the architecture of loading parts of the application. So basically, what Nicolas was also looking at which is, I don't know, loading GraphQL. It's kind of part of the bigger thing that we may need to approach more systematically. And yeah. the way how is this one gonna be implemented may be affected as well. So uh, I would try to aim at the bigger goal, which is like how we can selectively load parts of the application, maybe with immediate goal, uh, don't load GraphQL in the side key. Uh, and really start from, from, from that objective and figure out uh, how to approach that and how this sends our perspective on this particular one. Uh, so just put this one in the backlog for now then. Nicola, do you have like any comments to that one, maybe? Nicola went away. Um, I created an um, issue for the first part of this um, because yeah, like because it's not just GraphQL, right? There's a there's a couple other things like um, not rugged. What is it? Rouge, I think the syntax yeah. highlighter and a couple other yeah. tricky things. Grape uh, and um, but yeah, I agree with Camille. Uh, we probably don't want to end up with like fifteen different if then else's <laughs> on our boot path, you know, to figure out when to do these things. So I created a placeholder issue for, yeah, figuring out how we could do that in a more like pluggable approach that works for any of these, if that's possible, I don't know. Um, I, mean, I think I linked it somewhere further down. Yeah, I, will, I, I will start architecture blueprint for the idea of like managing application size and part of that blueprint that I'm going to see here is like discussing or like proposing the way to be in general, like more selective uh, in application loading. Uh, because like, it's really like, we just load too, ma too many things on all possible angles. And like, we need to like reduce the application size, which impacts the loading time impacts amount of the memory being used, impacts a space that is available for adding new features and impacts like our um, work really like for another year. So I think this architectural blueprint should give us like maybe some direction that like we in general want to reduce the memory usage. GraphQL and gems could be like the one of the aspects like that we may not load when it's not needed. Uh, but uh, I'm kind of looking that we should look at that problem more holistically. Like uh, if we have action cable and you don't need the process with the action cable, like how we can just disable this component 
or like any other component. Something that like I think we discussed last week uh, with Fabian, like how we can uh, reduce the application footprint, give us our self space to add a new more features, but kind of retaining the current footprint uh, for the time being. Yeah, and I had a I had a question with regards to the to the follow up items as well. And as you will be able to tell, I'm not 100% up to date. So I've I've tried to look through the epics and the outcomes of of the week. Do we have um, essentially a, a list of follow up items that are ranked by either, you know, for example, how much memory we are going to save by doing this that we estimate and some kind of, and Craig will see this from the memory side, some kind of stack ranking as to the complexity involved of achieving this, right? How confident we are in doing it, because that may help us then prioritize very clearly for the next milestones. It's like where to start, right? Maybe the GraphQL bit is the first one to start, maybe something else, but essentially a, these are the 10 or five items that, that we're going to work on in, in that order based on this ranking. Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, we kind of touched on this last week a little bit, but yeah, we didn't really come to a conclusion for how to <laughs> how to uh, do that. So we just went straight ahead and uh, broke issues out for where we think. Uh, yeah. Can we? The, the biggest impact would be. So did we like create all issues? I, I'm at least aware from my side that I'm still need to create one or two more issues. So maybe what we should do, maybe as part of these issues in the header, in some common form, or like as part of the comment, try to write like the impact and the complexity. Yeah. And, yeah, and, so and, I, maybe, and maybe assign weight for them this way. So um, we've done this with memory, uh, sorry, with database last week. There is a, a lightweight framework to to employ for this is called RISE, reach impact, confidence, and effort. It's essentially a way of just very simply ranking, you know, like issues in uh, based on those dimensions. And that may be a way here also to say, okay, you know, who is going to benefit from it? What's the expected impact? We have, we can measure that really in terms of memory, um, you know, how complex is it and how much effort is it going to take us roughly in, in weight or in, um, in months, whatever we prefer. And if everybody agrees, then we can, we can, once we have all of those issues, we can rank them in that, in that way. Um, could, you, Fabian, could you like, maybe um, like, the, like give us some hint, like how to do it, or maybe can you? Yeah, just, no, I think we have two, just, we have two options. Issues and like, we will just then follow up uh, these. Yeah, so we have two options with this. Um, option one is we do it async, right? Once all of the follow-up um, issues are um, created, I'll, I can create an issue now and actually um, explain sort of how, how it works. The other option is we can do it synchronously in the you know, memory team office hours at least and record it right, with the people that have time and then others can, can pitch in based on the output, which is probably a little bit more time effective, um, to be, to be honest. Um, I think, so I think step number one is finish all the issues, you know, and then step number two, uh, would maybe be like a 45 minute, um, ranking session in the team office hours, either tomorrow or whenever. So, um, I, I, I guess the question is like, uh, are we like, we will be able to prepare like all these issues in the good enough form for tomorrow. If not, maybe either tomorrow and I think the other office hours we have on Friday. Yeah, Friday works as well. And think Friday gives enough, maybe enough time, I don't know. So maybe, so maybe like we should try to like, if you could like help us with this framework. Um, yeah. So, so, okay, so but I can do Friday, we would to, like we would start asking, but then on Friday we would conclude on the office hours. Yeah, that sounds good. And I can open an issue in the Epic, sort of laying out the process, you know, and I can do that either, I'll do it probably tomorrow morning, I don't have time today, um, to say like, this is how this works roughly, right, then by Friday, the issues can be in, and then we can sort of come together in the office hours and just talk about it and, and compare, and we can record it for those that can't make it because of time zones. 
Cool, great. Thank you. Thank you for a good, very great idea. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, uh, thanks. One more question. So maybe I missed some of the meetings, but do we have anywhere pointed how we're going to implement this, let's say, optimization from the user side? Will it be some GitLab YAML config? Or how, how from the user perspective, they will install the constrained GitLab, let's say, the optimized GitLab on the machine? Or do we have an issue maybe? Because we'll have like kind of two versions of GitLab, right? Like for two gig memory, like four gig memory and like regular I'm, GitLab. Alexi, I, I'm kind of assuming right now that like uh, whatever we do, it doesn't degrade functionality or doesn't, uh, it doesn't increase the complexity of the configuration. So, so for example, so, so like they minus like, single mod, Will not fit so, uh, in. So, like, in so like Nicola grabbed you an example. It's like we just don't need it in the site key. So, okay. we just don't load it. And and I, I think like that any configuration should be last resort. Yeah. Okay. I agree. So, it's basically yeah. should be silently done. I see. I, I mean, like, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's good to like if, you, if, if we would have the examples of something that might be configurable, like, it's good to have the issue for that. But I, I think that our intent is should be like, we do not degrade functionality. We do not introduce uh, additional configurations for the things. We aim for things that are transparent. Yeah. My yeah, understanding. I, I there, there are oh, some, sorry. no, yeah, just like one, uh, one point about this. There are some areas where this will be tricky and where I do agree with Alexi, we need to think about this a bit more. Like uh, one good example is actually GraphQL and Grape and all these kind of workload specific uh, chunky gems that we currently load because um, only for GitLab.com, we actually separate our fleet into web and API workers. Not, not, probably most customers don't, don't do that, especially not the single node, smaller, you know, kind of two gigabyte deployments. So then the question is, um, how do you know without configuration, what does this node do? Or what, what if it does serve both kinds of traffic, then that point is kind of moot, right? Because you can, then you still will have to load all this stuff into the same process. So, so I think there are definitely open questions we need to think about. So, the comment that did I... it, Camille, if I understood you correctly, so for example, Puma single mode doesn't fall into our like list, right? Because it will require some total reconfiguration of stuff. And we don't have this configuration. So I'm... we should... I'm I'm yeah. unsure like how we would approach it. Maybe like if you would see that this is like only two CPUs and you have sidek enabled, like you would run Puma single mode by default. Mm, I see what you mean. So like okay. I, I'm kind of I like I'm kind of like um, our guidelines says convention over configuration. If we see something that is constrained, uh, let's try to be good by default. So maybe like for the Puma single mode to be chosen, like we say. Okay, your machine has less than three gigabytes of RAM. It uses less than less or equal to CPUs. We run in the single mode because this is the only mode that makes sense in this setting. Maybe this is how we define that. I so think that my two cents from the from the product perspective is that, in general, I think anything that is user transparent and just makes us more efficient, right? As in, we get you know a more efficient application without any drawbacks is probably the ideal scenario, right? It's like everybody wins. Following that is probably something where we can guess sensible defaults, right? For very constrained architectures, you know, as in we, we can maybe say, okay, you know, we know this is very constrained. So we're going to do it a little bit different, like in Puma. And I think then the last option is really to say, okay, you know, and that, that's, a, that's a bigger decision. Do we want to offer something, you know, where we just allow people to, by default, deactivate certain very expensive features because they don't use them, but that obviously degrades the, the user experience because by default, some things won't be available. And that's usually not something I think we would like to do, but that may still be an option. And I don't, I don't have enough data to see if that is actually required, right? And that's, I think, a larger question of, do you want to offer something like GitLab Lite, right? And maybe that's even the, the answer to sort of our 
fear in a way that there's disruption from the bottom, right? With some other products that come, they don't have all of the features, but they are very lightweight, right? And if we are like concerned that people will not choose GitLab because they perceive it as bloated, right? That may be actually a, a way of handling it. But I think that's maybe sort of in, that requires maybe a bit more investigation is sort of my feeling, right? And from what I hear, and please correct me if that's not correct, there are actually quite a few options of what to do with the application to make it more memory efficient without um, really impacting the user experience. Um, and so maybe those have sort of, are sort of the, the first phase of this, right? Because that's something you, we can do right now and will just benefit everyone. Yes, makes sense, makes sense. Thanks Camille and Fabian. Um, so that a question came to mind while we were talking about this. So re regardless of the outcome and how we implement this with silent or default configurations, do we have an issue that's tracking uh, the changes that we're going to make? Because uh, we're going to need to document that somewhere to inform users that if they're in a memory constrained environment, these configurations will have taken place during the install. And you know, perhaps they could upgrade their um, their VM or whatever to where the memory constraints no longer there, and they would want to change their settings. So, do we have something that is documenting the changes that we're putting in place? Do we have an issue to track that? Uh, do you do you talk about the issue or like documentation in general that is part of the omnibus, for example? Um, I think there's going to need to be like a, a big picture overview of what we've done for this two gig goal. Like what are all the changes almost, I don't know if it's going to be a blog post, but just a description of here are the changes that we made to get us to this smaller footprint. And here are the things like a, a single node install needs to consider that's different than a, a larger install. Okay. I, I, I'm hearing like two aspects. Like one is like smart of the two wiki gig week and the second is like an actual uh, list of the changes that needs to be made which may be user facing am i correct or, or um, you... yeah i was thinking yeah. more of the latter but actually both make sense so and because like I, i'm kind of thinking that like uh, maybe on friday when we meet with the with this rice framework we're just gonna have the summary of the two week basically and like the outcome and like what we discussed what we played why what we didn't work and maybe from that like we kind of work on the blog post to, to give like more insight yeah. like how it play out as well uh, but as for the documentation part let me find it well it's also um if i'm uh, the way i understood this like we don't quite know yet exactly what all the changes are going to be that we're going to make but I think as part of those changes, if, if I understand you correctly, Craig, we should definitely have a, if there are certain like differences in behavior, depending on where GitLab runs, right? There needs to be some kind of documentation saying, yes, if you have less than X RAM, right? And fewer than this CPUs, right? We will run Puma in that mode, right? And that is probably something that needs to go into Omnibus saying, running GitLab in, in a memory constrained environment, right? And then I would argue with every feature or with every change that we make, the documentation needs to be updated to reflect that, right? And that should be part of the, um, the work. And that probably accumulates quite a bit of, of change. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think it will also help with validating some of the things that we might now think are impactful, but we still have to verify or validate in production, for instance, because we have not done any, or I, I have not done any testing on dot compliance during the two gigabyte week, right? And so I'm looking into this issue of, around GC compaction now, right? And so we did this, you know, on our local machines and on, a, on an omnibus VM, but that's not what we run in production. So, right, we still need to see now, how long does it take, you know, in, in production to compact, you know, is that feasible? and so there's still a couple of things we need to figure out anyway. So yeah, I also think it would be useful to, to track that because we might just one, you know, decide against sorry. it in the end. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. One more question. Do we need like uh, to involve telemetry 
in this, so will we will we be able to see the difference if we will implement any improvements for constraint environment via telemetry or or not? So I'm Maybe not for omnibus or um for dot com. For omnibus, of course. I think I we mean, should. Yeah, I mean, I think we have. So we have control. this like memory lag, date, right? right? Oh, ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just would take a long time, right? Because we have the, a very slow feedback loop there because it always takes a while for users or for sufficient, a su sufficient number of users to upgrade uh, to the new version. And then, you know, we only submit the usage ping once a week. Uh, so it just yeah. usually there is like a lag of several weeks. Here is my question related in case we'll need to push something to telemetry before uh, like pushing mm -hmm. the improvements. So. I mean, do we need to review the usage pin data in case we miss something? And maybe, uh, I don't know, like- I think we should we should definitely make sure I, I'm that I'm not we... personally yet familiar with what we sent in telemetry, but I would say, I would probably say I would review that and see if we uh, send enough so we could see the difference when we improve uh, something. And if we don't send enough, we could like improve telemetry really fast so, because we expect the lag, so that was my point. I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of like thinking, Alexi. Like you had this Nokayashi fork, for example, mm -hmm. idea. Like telemetry is like one month for really, like the round trip. Uh, can we? Because, the trick like, to successful telemetry is also to deploy everything at once. So when you see the memory impact change you have no idea what actually happens because the feedback is like two weeks later or a month later it's actually I'm, quite tricky with so, usage being so i'm kind of thinking that telemetry can be good to see a trend but yeah. it's like very delayed but rather i would say that we should uh, do our validation and testing against running reference architectures and ensuring that it's also reflected on staging and uh, production Maybe one aspect for us to like to improve here is like contribute reference architecture that is smaller than the current ones. It's more constrained. And this is how we kind of measure uh, impact of our changes. It's still not gonna be, let's say 100% accurate because it's still not gonna run everything. Uh, but if we don't see like the improvement on, on this one, it's kind of unlikely that we're going to see improvements on the telemetry as well, which mm -hmm. is going to have significantly longer time to get updated. Well, this is maybe a tiny bit off, off topic, but I think this is maybe a longer longer term question for, for us is also, you know, we may want to improve our ability to actually measure the impact of changes on memory, you know, <laughs> allocation and how the application behaves as a whole and not only for the changes that we make but ideally also for the changes that other people make so that when you know things actually like somebody deploys a new feature they get information that when they do this you know our memory footprint is going to increase by x right and i think that may actually put us in a good position longer term to like let people know hey you're doing this but be aware you know you're bloating us and that has this impact on those architectures. And I think that that would be, I think, quite useful in the in the medium long term, in my that's mind. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great idea. But I could imagine it would be something with GPT. So it would be something like dynamic pipelines yes. will be running against the yeah. merge requests. And I mean, to be fair, we have invested in this, right? But I, I think it might still, and we are doing some of these things. Uh, we have, we do fail the pipeline if you, or we, well, we don't fail the pipeline, but we issue warnings if you add a dependency that's very large. But I, maybe we, it could benefit, the whole thing could benefit from a review maybe, like kind of because some of these changes have been put in place a year ago. And I'm not sure if you ever went back to look at and edit and see how effective this even was. Like, um, that, you know, do people actually see these errors? Like in on CI, do they act on them? You know, if we, how often does this job fail a signal that there was an increase in memory? I, I have no idea. I, I feel like some of these things we built and they are there and they run, but we're not sure how effective they are, I think might be one of the problems. So, so yeah, I totally agree. Um, 
but we should also recognize that we did do uh, a bunch of things in that area. So we should also, yeah, maybe review what we have done and figure out what did work and what didn't. And Fabian, that was a question that was asked um, in last week's meeting, like how do we have an ongoing measurement of memory growth and usage? And it's something I asked Grant about during our one-on-one -on -one last week. And um, he said the answer is right now, no, we don't have something, but he was kind of brainstorming. Like, yeah, he could see setting up a Docker environment where we quickly spin up, like, and, and he used a two gig um, environment as an example, spin it up, run it on a regular basis to see what the memory growth is and see where it starts to fail so that, you know, we don't have a one and done, like we set up a two gig environment and then the next week someone adds a feature that immediately blows it out of the water. So it's being discussed, but I don't think we have a formal issue to kind of track something like that. Oh, that's uh, that's really good to know. Thanks for the context. And again, I'm I'm sometimes I'm just not aware of some of those things. So I, you know, it, it, it's more. I think the conversation than... happened when you dropped off because I think you had to leave early last week. Yeah. So yeah, as I do now, unfortunately, but my meeting is moved <laughs> uh, from next week, and then I uh, I have a little bit more time. Um, anyways, I have a, I think I have an action item for this. Um, so thanks for the discussion. I, I learned a lot. So um, thank you for, for sharing these things so transparently. Um, OK. See you, Fabio. <laughs> Next week. Oh, you, this week. I'm also around. You can always ping me, right? OK. Um, cool, thank you. I, I, I just wanted to add one more thing to the discussion that we had. I'm actually finding that it's going to be super challenging to see the impact of the small features if they increase like the memory usage by let's say 500 kilobytes or like one megabyte it's very hard to see that given the scale of the application uh, but what we can really do it's like do statistical analysis of like github.com uh, because like github.com has pretty let's say uh, uniform traffic distribution it's actually test all the features maybe with different quantity uh, but should give you like the general feeling of like if the memory usage is growing or is it decreasing on the given moment if it's growing like how much so i think like github.com doesn't provide like with the granularity of the features uh, but should give us like also some indication the same as telemetry and but with also significantly faster feedback uh, if we are going in the right direction or if we are going in the wrong direction in terms of the memory usage because of the github.com we effectively hit all possible endpoints and we uh, like have some kind of distribution and like the statistical analysis should give us like pretty good indication like of the average uh, usage of, of the GitLab. I, I'm particularly talking here like for example, this tweaking JMalloc and GC settings. Like, this is one of the aspects that should, of course, impact constraint environments. But if we pick the right numbers, it should also provide a big deal on GitLab.com, uh, something that should be noticeable. Uh, instrumentation module, if we remove that, I honestly don't know, but maybe there are going to be some, uh, some small difference uh, there. Because if you, like, it's interesting aspect because like we run multi processes and multi it means many servers and many processes. So even one megabyte difference, if you do a summary of all the memory usage can actually result in an average drop if you compare the same period of the day to the last day of maybe like one, 100 megabytes and it starts to become noticeable then because it's not one megabyte, it's like 100 megabyte less on the whole fleet, which makes kind of a difference on the graphs. So uh, I'm kind of thinking that like, uh, we may be actually looking, we should be looking at all this data and use like the, what they provide us because the GitHub.com provides us very good stochastic distribution of the, of the load but also provides us a, very, a lot of different and as you might have pointed out, kind of granular 
services because like different sidekit and different sidekit jobs we have dedicated servers for action cable web api so actually they kind of give us some kind of granularity that, that should give us like if you sum these numbers it should give us like some indication if like the chance that we introduce is actually reducing or increasing memory so like reducing the duration or increasing if you compare before the deploy or maybe if you compare the the same period of the day from last day or maybe the same period from the last seven days and you kind of do uh, this kind of uh, comparison of the numbers so what i'm saying is like uh, it's kind of tricky because we may be looking at savings of just a few hundred mega a few hundred kilobytes per a single process that it's hard like to notice on the if you look at the single processes but if you look at 100 processes and 100 servers it's maybe become visible because of the amount and github.com can be something to provide this information much faster and makes it much easier for us to react i run the note Makes sense, but I mean, I agree that small small features could not be noticeable in terms of changes, even if it's increasing. But I don't think it blocks us from building such feature. We could just ignore and not like respond to anything if if there is nothing noticeable. Because if there is nothing noticeable by the let's say automatic pipeline, we could not also easily judge what the change is making. But if we see like 10 megabytes, 20 megabytes of difference on the GPT reference architecture, we could start like posting some warnings in the CI. So yeah, it's I not still actually, think like, we, we could make this. Yeah, Maybe so, uh, less aggressive, more silent, but like on some big changes. I'm, I, I, I'm pretty sure like what I'm saying, like that a lot of changes that we made they may they may give us some hint in the testing that they bring the benefit but the outcome may not be at all visible because of the scale impact the noise and it can be somehow hard to justify that this is meaningful chance uh, but i i'm kind of like thinking that overall we should be looking at the trends of all changes in the bike how much the trend is like benefit. What I'm saying, like this metrics instrumentation, for example, these modules, like seems so small, it's really hard to uh, understand uh, exactly how much benefit it's gonna bring. Like we, we can somehow estimate, but like, uh, I mean, in the end, I don't know really. In some cases, we're gonna see a, like a, a drop or maybe even increase. And in some cases, it's gonna be the same, but it doesn't mean that like this in the grander picture doesn't like in reduce the memory usage over time. So that's my problem. What what I'm kind of like saying like uh, it's really close to impossible to measure like for example the impact of the given endpoint on the memory usage unless you run that in the GPT with the very good testing suit covering exactly this endpoint, like something that we we, we, we fight it with the Nicola and the cache, cache queries, like, yeah, it's like, I, it's like looking for the needle in the stack, basically. I, I was <laughs> wondering, is. like, I think this had come up before in a, in a different discussion, but um, what do you think about the idea of, um, you, you, you saw the change that we are now, just as we did for sidekick queues, we're now labeling each controller, uh, uh, by category, by feature category, right? So every controller now has to be assigned to a feature category. And I was wondering, maybe that's a bit like too out there, but um, would it be possible to um, uh, do a like simulated run of GitLab where we color each object that we load into memory based on like provenance, like which feature it belongs to based on the class name, for instance, right? Because often we do, we're not super strict about it, but more often than not, we put them in namespaces, right? So for runner, like everything is in GitLab colon colon runner or something. Um, so I'm wondering like if it would be interesting to have some kind of memory map that way, you know, where we kind of color our domain in terms of, um, well, GitLab runner 
uh, consumes more memory because all those objects belong to the runner feature. Um, I thought if that was if that would be possible or doable, I, I think that could be really interesting to see because I'm sure there are features that are more like, uh, yeah, more interesting in terms of how they drive usage than others maybe. And it could be interesting to see if we're like maybe over investing memory as a resource in some features that are actually not that important drivers for like usage or whatever. Yeah, it's a bit, yeah, kind of like it's a crazy interesting idea. idea. And, and it's actually, Matthias, it's interesting idea. And I think like now when you started talking about that, we have a bunch of ways to like use that. Like there is trace object allocations, which gives you like a callback on each allocation. And this callback may include the stack trace, but maybe this is the way how you can hack and like, uh, let's say, as you mentioned, like the color code, uh, in what context the given object was allocated, maybe looking at the side key execution context of the current thread. Yeah, exactly. And what, I mean, what I, I imagine think, it would like, be- a, hmm. it's, It seems to waver. The question is like, is it possible to run that on the like, the high scale, like on running on github.com. So you could get this data yeah. live by like using the given category, for example. Or like you like need to run that in the fully controlled environment like a GPT. Yeah, if, yeah, exactly. Uh, I was more thinking about GPT or we could start with that. Um, yeah, and also I think uh, what we will very quickly notice is probably that there will be a lot of ob objects that are just in a generic use by everyone bucket, <laughs> right? Because um, there's a lot of like framework classes and stuff that will uh, consume a lot I'm, of memory. I, uh, I'm, that... I'm kind of wondering, like, can we accurately get a number of the objects that got allocated for the given, let's say, site key worker being executed? Because right now, like we, we right now have a matrix for the database call. Maybe like instead of the color coding, we could like get a number of the objects that got allocated as part of that execution, but like the accurate number. Because like uh, taking into account the, the threading and that multiple side key workers can, can be executed uh, during the same, at the same time. So if we could somehow get like the exact number and also the amount of the memory that is allocated, this should give us some idea of the generated memory pressure on the garbage collection. And maybe if we would be able to do it efficiently, maybe we would include that as part of the, of the metrics. Uh, and we would also- We have, that a, we have an issue for tracking this so that we can follow up on it async. We can get through the rest of the agenda here. Yeah, no, I know we don't have an issue. Uh, what do we need to call the issue then? Or do you want to, Matthias? Do you want to create it or Camille? Yeah, sure. I can. I can create it. Okay. All right. Um, from action items from last week, I'm going to jump back to where we were. So we are going to backlog this one. Uh, I don't think we talked about this one, but it looks like there's a couple comments in here. It's not impactful. So. Um, do we need to keep this one in 13.7? Or should we move it back to 13.8 or backlog? What do you think, Camille? I mean, I'm still wondering if it could be useful for .com like, to look at this. It will it's, be it's useful. Not, it's not low hanging fruit, right? This is maybe, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm like on one angle, I'm thinking like backlog that because okay. maybe there are some other ones. But on the other hand, uh, maybe there is someone interested in that on checking like how complex it would be to implement it. Well, it doesn't so, seem like, to fit I, in the immediate goal of two gigs, right? Or the memory constraint footprint. So I will I will push it back to at least 13.8 and put it in the planning discussion. Why, why I'm saying that? Because like this, if done, would reduce a ton of memory on github.com. Like it would be like a drop to maybe a half or maybe like even one third to, to what we use today. So uh, it's actually something that from the perspective of github.com gives like a lot of 
room. So uh, this is this is why I'm kind of torn. <laughs> Yeah. Because like on, on the small installs, it's not uh, being used. On the on the large instance, we can like the same impact as like with the let's say using Puma and reducing amount of the workers. This actually is a big memory saving, and I can Craig, if you are interested, can give you like uh, let's say a pretty accurate number what it does mean. So I'm I'm after Matthias. I'm unsure if this is low hanging fruit or is it not? Someone would have to actually figure out how, what it would take to, to implement it. I just don't know that at that moment. Uh, maybe we can put it on the list of things to go through the um, rice framework to see where it ranks. All right, and... Uh, Get a list for that too. All right. Um, let's see. And then I ran through action items from last week. Do we have an issue for this one? I couldn't find one between the two epics that we have. Mm, okay. And we'll find enough details to create an issue for that. Right. And we did, I found this one after a commentary about which epic things go under. Um, looks like we do need an issue for this one. And then I have notes on these, so we need a summary for this one. We actually have an issue in the epic for a summary. Um, we need an issue for this one. I already have that in action items. Those are all notes. We're going to cover the rice framework. Um, and then Fabian had a follow up. I don't know if you guys are following along on image resizing. It looks like it's going to follow the group manage. And um, Matthias asked a question about the uploads. I'm not sure if that falls under the same group or not, um, but it's assigned to Fabian. He will follow up on it. And then I have about five minutes left of this meeting. So, from Retros, having a regular demo as part of this meeting, uh, any thoughts on those who have not already weighed in? I think Matthias, Camille, and Fabian all found that to be interesting. You certainly can, just need to throw it on the agenda. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. I think I had initially suggested to use the office hours uh, to make mm -hmm. it like super informal, but um, yeah, we could do it as part of this meeting meeting as well. I don't think I would want it to like take away too much time from like, yeah, like planning concerns because that's important as well. Yeah. I, I would prefer it, it to feel like, um, yeah, like a uh, low, low entry barrier <laughs> kind of, you know, right. yeah. uh, people like really, um, yeah. Make it, make it super easy to contribute to that uh, and kind of informal, but um, we could still record it, you know, and, and, and put it up somewhere. But yeah, we can discuss that in the issue. Yeah, um, yes. uh, I like the I, idea I, of demos as long as they're not forced, like you said, low, area, uh, low barrier to entry. Um, I've been in companies where they forced weekly demos and sometimes they were not meaningful. Um, so I'm, I'm supportive and open to however it wants to be implemented and however it's ultimately implemented. Sorry, you know, I think I cut you off. Um, no, I, I think like what you are Craig, saying makes sense. Like it should be as free model as possible, like with minimal um, preparation. As for the timing, I'm kind of thinking that maybe the best moment would be, let's say one week before the like the release, so like somewhere around before 22nd, uh, because on, on that angle, like it would make Fabian to better understand what to put in the release post, mm -hmm. uh, but also it would make us to somehow conclude uh, this milestone. And the next week we would basically start working on the new milestone on, and the new tasks. So I, I'm kind of like looking that if you would do demo, it would be demo maybe not only to us, but also for you, 
and also Fabian and also anyone that would be interested on like kind of like I guess maybe more like recapping like the 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 uh, kind of finishing milestone, yeah. uh, like what improvements we had, and also maybe like the outcome of the demo. It's also like we really know what should be our release post item, something that we kind of struggling to to prepare ahead of the time. So maybe there it would have like the joint benefit as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe like the last Monday before the 17th, kind of loosely aim for that. Um, or, or, or maybe like the, the like the, the week of the 17th or something like that. So like so somewhere around like the feature freeze, basically, like um, around the time. Okay. I, 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 I'm not sure like what other spots, but I, I'm kind of thinking that this demo could be kind of useful uh, for various people, not only for the engineers and understanding like what we are working on, but also like increasing the knowledge and the results. So uh, it's my perspective. So feel free to disagree in the issue. Yeah. Well, that's a good idea. Thanks for thanks for raising it, Matthias. All right. Um, and I will copy the other action items down here below. It looks like we got through. The agenda. Are there any other topics folks wanted to cover before we end today? I, I just wanted to quickly like ask or mention that um, I, I'll probably pick up one or two items before we um, that go through the voting already. Is that is that okay or um, yeah? Because yeah. I think especially like there's one that we, we kind of know would be very impactful, which was the drop uh, dropping GitLab exporter. But I, mm -hmm. that's one of these issues that has a lot of lead time because we really need to look at. We don't even know like who's using that and to what extent and which metrics uh, do not exist in other, um, uh, are not exported for other processes yet and stuff. So there's a bunch of stuff to look into uh, yeah. that would help us, I think, also then, uh, uh, yeah, decide how complex it actually is to do. Yeah, I think, yeah, feel free to continue with what you see as priority right now. I think where it'll be interesting is like the topic we just covered, the um, pre-forking, um, it'll help to decide whether we're working on it now or whether mm -hmm. we um, have a singular focus on the memory right. constrained environment, right? Um, yep. it, it was interesting with the database team because we had about six different topics that the team was focusing on and it helped the team to come together and focus on two and really make some rough cuts on, okay, we are, we are actively deciding to not work on these other four things and we need to inform stakeholders that we're gonna work on them much later on. So it'll be a good exercise, but I think it'll have a different outcome than the database team. So I think mm. this one, I think will help us to focus on what's most important with the two gig footprint. And uh, is there anything else that we need to bring in on kind of on the side while we're trying to finish up this initiative? So yes, continue with what you're working on. Don't let the, the waiting exercise um, stop you from anything. Got it. Thanks. Cool. All right, if there's nothing else, I think that's it. Thanks, everybody. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. See ya. Monday.